<laughs> Draft Physics Video Production. Well, presentation. Comments. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Jeremy Hall. Uh, so you think the universe is deterministic? It's the rational deduction if there's nothing to counter it. And there's, in my opinion, zero evidence that any wind is blown or any rock has fallen or anything has ever happened that can't be traced to the causes, the circumstances, the variables. That every one of the variables is controlled by causes. And <clears throat> yes. There's just no way to escape it. Nothing just happens to um, elephants don't fly, <laughs> pigs don't fly. I don't know. You know, there's no magic, uh, no event that ever has been recorded in human history that in some way breaks those rules. There's not even a coincidence where you say two things. Those two things happen at the same time. Two, you know, brother and sister end up getting married because they were adopted by different people. Well, you can follow the trail and see how it was inevitable. That, you know, they didn't just, something didn't magically happen to create the bizarre circumstance. So even the most bizarre circumstances have explanations, causal explanations. So, yes. <clears throat> it means that everything is caused by something else. Yes, everything is caused by the environment, the variables that it's surrounded by. Yes, the little bits of energy hitting it. Um, <clears throat> the interesting question, see, that's to you, it's interesting. To me, it's a totally uninteresting to say, well, what made it? What made the stupid, clunky, stupid machine? And it's a stupid, clunky machine. It's just not a really brilliant thing, okay? It's this idea of stuff colliding with other stuff, banging into it. And all you do is you set up the little, um, the BBs, uh, the pachinko machine. You set it up with little pins in certain locations, and you say, what happens to the BBs when I drop them through? You know, you, you make a device, and then you throw something in it to move around in, the, in the, the shape of it, like the shape of the pinball machine or something. Who cares who decided to put the bumper there and who decided to put one there? <laughs> who cares? It's rudimentary. It's, it's not something brilliant. Yes, it can evolve complexity, um, so what? I mean, it's just not a question that's worth asking, in my opinion. It's not even worth p p p breaking your brain to say, how big is big? Forget about it. You're not going to get a good answer. All right, it means everything is caused by something. All right, interesting question is where <coughs> it starts. So to you, that's interesting. To me, it's totally, your answer is going to, what do you think the answer is going to be? The answer is going to be is there's, you know, a universe and it, uh, you know, it makes a mistake every now. So the universe has a machine and it can, it creates nothing over and over and over again. It creates nothing. And all the, every now and then something goes a little bit wrong and whoops, a something pops out, a little quanta, a little golf ball gets, you know, ejected. Uh, and it could happen once, you know, every trillion gazillion years. And how would we know the difference? Because we don't know how old the whole thing is anyway. We don't know what it's doing. So I can just come up with a simple answer for you that the stuff got thrown into it. It's a closed system. That is, the universe is a bubble. Every bit of energy, like for little photons that actually do bounce off here and go out the window and fly through the universe... And they don't hit anything. The ones that go outside the universe, they really don't go outside the universe. They hit the wall and they bounce back as invisible gravity. You know, a little quanta without a frequency. So they go in with a frequency, hit the wall, no frequency coming back. So it's just a closed bubble. The bubble, see, the frequency gets lost because the bubble is flexible. So the bubble just kills the frequency, dampens it. Sends back the same amount of energy. <clears throat> just sends it back in a form that's not a photon anymore. So the whole system just keeps, you know, bouncing around. The ball, the pinball, never goes. There's no bottom to the pinball machine, okay? There's just, there's no hole. The ball can fall through to go out. So the ball just keeps bouncing forever inside the, the pinball machine. And, okay, that works. <laughs> yeah doesn't explain anything like what's outside of the bubble doesn't explain other universes doesn't, you know, who cares 
Again, you, you want to waste your time trying to figure it out. You're saying that what? What's the, what's the right answer? That God made more big stuff? Like the universe was this big with God in it, and then God said, let's make it even bigger? <laughs> yeah. Well, what's, your, what's your, going to be your stupid answer? Oh, this is uh, pathetic. Anyway. I already believe there is an infinite chain of cause and... <clears throat> And reason, whatever reason would be. No, I don't believe there's any reason in the elements of the universe. And reasoning isn't something created. It's something discovered. You discover truth. You don't just uh, make it up. Uh, quantum fluctuation. So, <laughs> so, so their solution is, is let's just pretend the universe is just popping little bits out and then consuming little bits. Now, my argument against that is we know that really little bits, little tiny things like photons travel all the way, you know, 13 billion light years, an incredible voyage, and they don't seem affected at all by all these little burps and bibbles that are coming into the and out of the universe. So it just seems kind of unlikely that there's any force that's randomizing anything, you know. But you want to believe it? I don't know. What the hell? Go ahead. Believe whatever you want to believe. I can't stop you from being a silly person. I'm just saying, how can you think this is a question, number one, you'll ever answer, ever? You're ever going to qu acquire the information from anywhere? Even if you could find the universe actually burping one of these free energy bits, um, <laughs> you know, how would, it, how would it, expl it wouldn't explain size? It wouldn't explain anything to you. It wouldn't give you any of these answers. Oh, fuck. Um, <clears throat> quantum fluctuations take care of that problem. They don't take care of anything. They don't extend. They're, they're, they're not an answer any more than God is an answer. What is it? How how does a quantum fluctuation tell you how big the universe is or how old it is? It doesn't tell you a damn thing. Uh, below Planck scale, these become so dominant that causality breaks down. So, again, there's no causality because there's no function. You're saying there's some random burpee stuff, okay, that just places energy in a position. Well, my argument is it doesn't matter. <clears throat> if I just start with a <clears throat> condition, a pre-existing condition of bang, explosion, or anything else, and I, all you're really saying is, is there's stuff in positions and moving somewhere. So if I freeze the universe, it has stuff. It has, <clears throat> you could argue that these electrons and protons evolved somewhere in the process, and they exist. So you know what exists. That's what the elemental universe is made out of, is those elements. So, I mean, <laughs> how does how does this... Well, this bit just popped into it. You know, the, the, this one just went into the vacuum and th came out that way. How, how does that fix it? And how does that make it coherent? So I would argue that that's not going to work, actually. Because everything is so reliable. Everything does exactly. The proton is reliable in its function. The electron is reliable. And it, all these things are reliable in their function. Now, you know, they're, the, the physicists are saying they're not reliable because they're pretending they're not in a single position and a lot of other nonsense. But, no, they really are. It really does matter whether you go, the little photon travels right next to this finger or right next to this finger or goes right through the middle. Those are different outcomes. If the photons go here, they will always do some certain thing. And when they go through the middle, they'll always do a certain thing. And when they go right next to this surface, they'll always do a certain thing, a certain group of, of possibilities. And those groups of possibilities are not the same possibility. Oh, anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, all right. Imagine if the universe is just a temporary pattern. Well, it's always just a temporary pattern because it's constantly the pattern constantly changes because the universe is really made out of that stuff moving the speed of light so yes the pattern constantly changes but it isn't constantly randomized it isn't the little bits aren't constantly the the photon heading to us from alpha centauri or whatever that's taken a year to get here it doesn't just blip out or blip into existence the and the consequences of that blipping bullshit would be a bunch of fake things. We'd end up, by the laws of probability, you would roll the five dice, and every now and then the five dice would stack right on top of each other, and you'd get a coincidence, okay, a bizarre coincidence, and you'd see little 
little ghosts or magical things. But we don't see those. People with your mindset try to make them up, but they don't exist. You don't have any good pictures of your UFOs. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, like the ones you see in the foam of crushing wave. There, you're back to the little wave metaphors, little blah, 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 blah. So again, I, I'm just going to argue, there's no evidence that anything in the foam, okay, is breaking causality. So you're going to say it's like something that doesn't have any break in its causality. That's all you're saying. You're saying anything that's a little bit complicated to figure out how it happened, we're going to say it's magic. Or the magic forces made it. All right, so you're telling me that there's some piece of that foam that got there through a random, spontaneous event. And I'd say, prove it. All right, <clears throat> but we are stuck in it <clears throat> and seeing reality in slow motion. Well, yes, of course, we're seeing reality. That is, the small universe is doing trillions of activities and every second we slowly process. So in every second, it seems like a really fast thing, the universe inside of little things is doing a whole lot of stuff, billions of years worth of interactions on our scale taking place within one second for their scale. So what? Uh, okay, anyway. Uh, to us, the pattern seems stable, and we think of it as the laws of nature. <clears throat> the point is, is that we can see elements of it, tiny, tiny little bits of it we can uh, measure and interact with. And so we don't have to do this pretending thing. Um, okay, there is no beginning and no end, whatever the fuck that means. It doesn't mean anything. Well, what does beginning and ending have to do with the fact that we can understand um, our existence in the context of improbable events? And we can even point out where those improbable events are in our evolution. The things that only happen one time. No competing process ever took place. No similar s coincidence. The seven lightning strikes in, you know, 14 seconds happened in one place on Earth, and it didn't happen, doesn't happen all the time, doesn't happen everywhere, doesn't happen every year, doesn't happen every million years, doesn't happen every billion years. Truth is, that's how events happen. Even in your syllabus, okay, there are going to be events that happen only once. <laughs> you know, that's what they do. They only happen once. Oh, shit. Um, this is just, it's just, like, again, it's just turning physics into a, a religious subject. Let's try to answer questions that really have nothing to do with physics. You're not going to find the answer to those questions. You're not going to find a videotape. There's no way to get the answer. Um... <clears throat> Only constant change in patterns that last a while until they turn into something different. And they, again, so your argument is somehow they're turning into something different. And uh, like you're making some evolution argument that it just all of a sudden the chicken poofed a turtle. You know, it's just bullshit. No, a turtle didn't hatch from a chicken egg. Uh, does this like make sense? No, it doesn't. To me it does, but hard to explain. Well, I think you did a reasonable job of explaining it, but it, it's, not a, it's not a useful subject. Again, if, if you think physics is going to answer these questions, you're thinking badly, um, because it's not. And the... <clears throat> uh, like I said, I can give, if I could give you the truth, you're going to be totally unimpressed I promise you so if I could tell you the actual cause and of the universe you're gonna be like oh so so you mean the universe does just you know that's it's like this constant flat nothing and all of a sudden it error codes and something something happens a something and some things are just errors okay in the perfect nothing every now and then you have error and you end up with something. I mean, what's, you know, what's an error when you're making nothing? <laughs> yeah, something. That would be the error. Uh, anyway. All right. So, um, oh, there was some other little comment of 
less than useful. Well, whatever. Just you know. Uh, let's see. Whether it's deterministic or not, what will be the future? It's not ours to see. The universe is your, unless you're a t tachyon Jesus particle. Um, the reason is, let's go, oh, we already did that. And of course, there's going to be stuff that's not completely accurate. Did that. Quantum goofs, perturbators, I don't need that. Uh... Alright, so here, there's no doubt gravity is a push force, and Einstein's gravity funnel cannot plot an elliptical orbit. Try it yourself and see. Well, neither can any gravity theory. Whose gravity theory? can make elliptical orbits um, out of the function. There's no way to do it, right? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> no, I mean, the other, it'd be the other way around. A circular orbit's, the perfect circular orbit's the one you're really in trouble with. But I mean, the ellipse is a consequence of the fact that you have, um, these, well, I, as I pointed out, orbits are already not possible. <clears throat> I mean, you can't, come from the outside into a gravitational body, right, from the outside, there's no way to, there's no speed that'll get you into an orbit. It'll either get you into a spiral that you crash, or you'll fly out of the system. But those are the only two options, unless, you know, because your velocity is going to increase. So, so gravity will pull you in, or gravity will be too weak and you'll fly out. But you can't do anything else unless <clears throat> you have an engine. You know, unless you have something to change your speed. So the only way you can get in an orbit is you have to come in and you have to hit something, okay, to slow you down. Or you have to fire a retro rocket, you know, and, and <laughs> you know, sh slow yourself down. Um, because if you don't, you're leaving or you're crashing. So that's it. Those are the only two choices. So the only way you get into an orbit in the first place is to have something affect your speed. And it's just the law of averages are that you're, <clears throat> no matter what orbit you get into, you're always going to go into the orbit with a certain momentum. And so you're always going to have a bias in a direction. So no matter where you came in from, that's going to be your ellipse. Now, the truth is that there could be a perfect circumstance. You hit something just right and your speed is just made just perfect, and then you end up in a perfect circle. But, you know, it's like one in a million, you know, or whatever the real, one in 10,000. So the Earth is in a pretty close to a round orbit. I mean, it's only 4% off, which is tiny. Um, and so, you know, you can get in pretty, pretty good circular orbits. But the ellipse is just the, the fact that you're always going to come into the orbit, so to speak at a direction, and that direction is going to create a bias in your orbit. <clears throat> but there's no gravity theory that that works in terms of you can't get into an orbit unless something slows you down. I mean, technically, it could speed you up. You could be, you could come in here, be heading right for the sun. You could just speed up and loop around that way. But I mean, you you have to change the velocity. If you don't change your velocity, you can't get into an orbit. You have to hit something. That's you know, sort of the rules. Everything else ends up going into the the you know, falling apart. And that's why it's a little tricky to put satellites up there and have them stay. <laughs> you know. Anyway, uh, all right. So the Skyrim guy. All right. <clears throat> what? What don't you believe about classical mechanics? So again, I don't know if I phrased it that way. What don't you think? Where, where was Newton wrong? Is what I'm pointing out. An actual statement. An actual quotable statement or something like that uh, many things like its predictions so again this stupid predictions word um, fuck you it's not about predictions it's about descriptions of why something happens the why statements are what we're looking for about fast moving objects so again he's oh he's telling us 
what the classical theory was on how motion is absorbed, how things absorb energy. And Newton didn't even posit. He said, I don't even posit an explanation. But he's going to force words into Newton's mouth. So he's going to make up, like, like they, they always do this kind of thing, like, well, why can't something just keep going faster and faster? Well, because there's no hand to push it that can go fast enough to push it, right? It's like saying, why isn't the, well, can't the boat go faster than the wind is blowing? <laughs> right? So the boat's going... 20 knots or whatever and the wind's only four knots well can can the wind push the boat well i don't think so because the boat's moving away from the wind faster than the wind's coming so how can the boat get pushed by the wind that's slower than the boat's moving that isn't likely to happen um you know so there's just a, the certain fact is i can't push something faster if i can't move my pusher faster than the object's going. So if the fastest speed that anything's traveling is the speed of light, how the hell could anything else move faster than that? Because the force couldn't get catch up to it to push it. So if you understand that the universe is made out of pushes, you got to actually hit it with the force. Then how could the force ever add energy to something once it's reached the speed of light? How does the light catch up to it to push it? Oh, that's right. It can't. So that's the classical explanation. Are you going to say the classical explanation is something else? That classical physics requires there to be some other mechanism? No, it clearly states classical physics tells you, once, once you tell the classical people that, yeah, there's nothing happening instantaneously, you know, that instantaneous isn't the right answer, that, like, for example, Newton could know that the speed of light, but he couldn't know the speed of gravity. So to him, it could be instantaneous. He didn't know. But if you just tell him, no, it's not instantaneous, it's the speed of light, then Newton will tell you, well, yeah, obviously gravity can't make something go faster than light then because the force is only going that speed. So how could it possibly push something faster than the speed of light? It can't. All right. <clears throat> Like its predictions about fast-moving objects close to the speed of light are very small objects. So, yeah, again, so classical physics is supposed to know uh, stuff it didn't even know existed. Oh, yeah, sure. It has a theory. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. But it works fine for many phenomena that we are used to. So it doesn't say anything about anything. Your statement says nothing. So I asked you for what you, you don't believe. What, where did it get something wrong? You didn't quote somebody getting something wrong. You know, beyond the fact that you might be able to find a quote somewhere where somebody, in, you know, 200 years ago said that gravity was instantaneous communication between bodies because they didn't know the answer. Um, so is that that's all you got? That's the best you can do? Clearly, they could have posited something like, well, maybe it goes as fast as light. <laughs> yeah, they could have said that. All right, I was trying to point out that your theory doesn't make novel quantitative... What does this mean? Qualitative prediction, Quantitative predictions. Well, the fuck it does. I'm predicting you're going to be such fools, okay? I mean, it's just going to be so obvious you were duped. You've believed things that have never been proven to be true, like light being bent by gravity. Lots of things... So there's lots of, I've made a ton of predictions about the fact that you're going to find out that your light isn't any stupid magnetic and electric wavy thing. There are no such things as these idiotic fields that the two, the functions are basically charge functions. That is, electrons repel each other and protons repel each other. And they do it because there's something in between them that's repelling them, a force bouncing back and forth. And those two forces have to be distinctly different to cause the distinctly opposite effects in the two objects. So there is no fields. There's just two kinds of force, not two kinds of field. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> at least from what I have seen. Well, you haven't looked at anything then. Every freaking video has some statement about how you're wrong, okay? And it's someday you're going to find out you're wrong. All right, it assumes classical mechanics. It doesn't do any such thing, so this is more horseshit. No, it, pro no, it says quite clearly there's a really easy thing that we can know happens in the universe, and that is push. 
thing A bangs into thing B and they share information. So the thing is sitting here, something else hits it, okay, and it shares information with that thing and there's a consequence. You know, either the things bounce off this way or there's a, a complete absorption of all the energy and this thing bounces off at the same speed this had. There's rules about how you push, how you bang into things. And what it's clearly saying is there are none of these silly, I pushed you by banging into you. That doesn't happen. Nothing goes, I pulled you. Nothing goes the opposite way when you hit it this way. There's a, there, there's an economics to momentum. Okay, and momentum doesn't do this reversal nonsense. Assumes classical mechanics. Again, what do you mean by classical mechanics? Is that Yes, bowl, cannonballs will blow holes in boats. Yes, that's real solid mechanics. Okay, and proceeds to explain why things do what they do, which makes it a philosophy. So this is just more horseshit. Uh, I'm going to call you a pedophile. All right, because, you know, clearly you just make these accusations. There's, I'm not doing any different kind of physics than the physicists are doing, jackass. And I'd say it's even more physics than their physics. Their physics is the one full of philosophy in terms of they just make up fantasy characters uh, like like role playing, like like three bears and Goldilocks. They're a little dark matter and they're dark energy and they're bent nothings and all this kind of crap. You're the one doing philosophy, you fucking pussy. All right, this has nothing to do with philosophy. This is explaining the evidence that we see, the experiments, these events. We're explaining what's causing them. You're saying the bent space, the, the matter tells the space what to do, and the space tells the matter what to do. You're making up a little fairy story as an explanation. Uh, anyway, not a scientific theory. So that's just fucking bullshit. Absolute fucking bullshit tactic, you motherfucking little child molester. I mean, you have no right to call people philosophers because they disagree with you. All right? It's just as scientific to say, how do you explain what we observe? You say, well, we're going to explain it by inventing talking bears. You know, that smoke cigars and eat porridge and wear pants. If you have a link to where you actually make some written, novel, qualitative, and testable predictions, I'm predicting that the, the two-slit radar experiment is jamming. Okay, and you can test it really easily. I'm, I'm predicting that, yes, your, theory, your whole theory of photons is bullshit because I can explain why the three polarizing filters makes more light. Okay, you can't explain it because you think something got destroyed. Oh, God, you're such a lying piece of shit. So anyway, there's been a ton of qualitative statements made by me. They're just as testable as your stupid fucking predictions, douchebag. I mean, if there was some easy way to videotape photons, then I'd say, go ahead and do that, shithead. But we're stuck, as I pointed out in the video, with all of us are stuck with pretty shitty evidence. Your theory is an invisible man bullshit theory. Mine is a nice, easy, simple mechanical theory. Two plus two plus two physics. Why don't you explain how it doesn't work? Why don't you link me to the theory of magnetism? Why don't you show me one video on YouTube where you think, oh, there, they've explained mechanically how a fucking magnet works. Show me one video explaining any kind of mechanical function. All right, and um, uh, I'll challenge you then to do the same to my video. Let me see your best guess at how a magnet works, and then you try to explain how my theory doesn't work. There's subject videos, a whole bunch on magnetism. Just pick one of them and explain how my theory doesn't fit the fucking evidence. You fucking lying piece of shit with your testable predictions. Your tests suck. Your exaggerations are obvious. Your complete made-up bullshit um, fantasy characters are obvious. Uh, then, then please provide it. <clears throat> I won't take videos where you just draw pictures. Oh, so drawing pictures isn't explaining how something works. You don't draw pictures. Well, guess what? I won't accept arguments that where you can't draw a picture. If you can't fucking draw a picture, you're right. I mean, this is how magnets work. 
okay? I'm not going to draw it, okay? <laughs> I won't draw you a picture, okay? Uh, the magnet just creates this positive stuff and this negative stuff, and it attracts and it repels by the magical magic. There, I've explained the magnet. I mean, I'm not going to accept it if you can't come up with some fucking explanation. I mean, it's sitting here right in front of you. It's not that complicated. North, south. Well, why don't you explain? Why does the electron repel? And why does the proton attract? Why don't you explain why? What motivates the proton to go from here to here? What tells it, I must do that? What's the fucking mechanism, you fucking douchebag? So anyway, this is just such bullshit. <laughs> he won't accept literally modeling it. Literally creating a model and explaining. But he will accept, well, it's a virtual thing, a virtual photony thing. You know, it moves the speed of light, I'll tell you that much, this, this electromagnetic wavy thing. Uh, but yes, I can't explain why the electron moves towards the north side because that seems really stupid. <laughs> you know, uh... It doesn't make any sense at all because a proton goes, comes right into it. And why does the electron move away from it? I don't know. Virtualness. That's all you have, you piece of shit. And you're the scientist? The scientist can't draw the picture? <laughs> okay. So, so anyway, so right there, you've just closed all rational conversation. Oh, a drawn picture of the actual mechanism isn't good enough. A model, a working model isn't good enough. That's not evidence of anything. Showing me a working model of your theory? Oh, no, that's, that's not evidence. God, amazing. All right, so no point. You will be soon... <clears throat> disregarded is just a waste of my fucking time. I'm a scientist, but I won't take videos where you show how the model works. <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, let's see. Why does the single slit produce two wave functions? It doesn't. Well, let's do, let's go over it again. Okay, there's no other way to explain what they say. None. There's no other. So he'll, maybe he'll say Huygens, right? Maybe that's what he'll use. Like Huygens will be his excuse. Which sounds even more preposterous, right? I mean, you have a single slit that we agree on. Now, how do you, how do you make interference? You know, okay, is that you have to create two waves. There's no other way to do it. You have to do it. To create the interference pattern, you have to create somehow two things out of this one circumstance. And so what they do is they say Huygens. So Huygens is this preposterous nonsense that every wave... You know, every wave creates an infinite number of little waves ahead of it. And that's how it moves through space. So when it moves here, what it really did was it created an infinite number of little baby waves. And they all combine to create a new wave frontier. So it's an infinite number. So he's a physicist. He's a scientist. And he says there's an infinite number of something inside this space. <laughs> yeah. And he's a scientist. Yeah. You know, it would be a philosopher would say, oh, show me, or what the fuck are you talking about? There's an infinite number of something inside of this space? Well, what's outside of that? Double infinite? <sighs> so anyway, and then what do they do, right? This is, <laughs> this is their gimmick. They say, well, you see, every, all those little waves, they all cancel each other out, except for this one and this one. <laughs> That's what they do, literally. What they do is they say, well, if we look at it from here to here, okay, yeah, it all cancels out except for one, okay, because there's an odd number, let's say. And then, you know, if we go from here to here, they all cancel out. They don't do this, like, oh, yeah, they all cancel out if I go from here to here. You get me? I mean, you could say there was 14 things, so let's just cut the infinite and, and just say it's an even or odd number, right? So, so if I say there was four things, you know, instead of an infinite number, there was four little waves created. You know, I could say, oh, this one cancels out with this one, and this one cancels out with this one. Oops, now there's zero. But if I make it five, well, then I'm going to have a problem, right? Because then, well, then I got one left over. So then I have one wave anyway getting through. But I mean, obviously, the simple trick they do is they just sit there and bisect it. They just bisect it here and say, this cancels, all these cancel out with each other. So... 
this one cancels out with this one and this one cancels out with this one and this one cancels out with this one and they keep this one and they keep this one. <laughs> and so they, they just make two waves. But it's a contrivance. I mean, you can watch them contrive the existence of these two waves so they can create this nonsensical idea that you have this interference pattern and nothing else is going on here and you have to just be a lying sack of shit Okay, not to admit, that's exactly what they've done. They took one slit and they made two waves in it. That's it. There's no other, There's nothing else they're doing. Okay, and then when there's two slits, right, <laughs> they just pretend that didn't happen with one slit. So they just pretend, oh no, one slit just makes one wave. I mean, oh, let's not, let's not be idiots and play silly games and pretend that a slit makes two waves. Hell no. Oh, but yeah, in single slits, it does make two waves. But when it's, there's double slits, no, it only, makes, it only makes one wave. I mean, clearly, this is only one hole. Why would this hole make two waves? That's crazy. Why would this make two waves? No, it can't happen. I mean, you're, you're just such fucking, yeah, you're just so dishonest. Okay, it doesn't, he said. So, I mean, clearly their theory depends on it making two wave functions in the single slit. There's no other way to create the interference pattern. Okay. Why is the single object turned into two objects? QM doesn't state that. Well, clearly it does. I mean, I called it object. I mean, an object goes in, okay, that's a one, and somehow you turn it into two things. I mean, clearly it's one electron, it goes through both slits, so something goes through two, two slits. So I said object, I'm just giving you the option. You can make the object break in two, or you can make the object transform into two wave functions. I don't care what you call them. It's clearly turning into two separate momentums. And then it's turning into 5,000 momentums, you're saying. But it only lands as one momentum in one location and it sometimes it somehow retracts all the other energy that it used going out to all the other locations that's your stated theory there is no other theory um you have to have two objects to have interference no all right so there's no real point right so he says one thing can interfere with itself without being turned into two wave functions so when they go through all this nonsense about how you need the, the double slit, you need the impediment to break it into two, you know, that's what it does. It breaks the wave into two waves. <laughs> well, the whole thing was based on that, right? But I don't need a breaker for the single slit. It just magically happens. Okay, so you're just such a shithead. All right, with interference, I mean... <clears throat> the wavy pattern of intensity detected on the screen it doesn't have to be a screen with crest and troughs again you're saying that's what it's made out of okay all it is is a change in the direction of the photon so let's all understand that all we're talking about is photons come in and they have this propensity okay for the light to be registered in certain locations and not in other locations but it's just photons being misdirected, to redirected. And the truth is also is that there's every reason to believe that the amount of photons that go in, okay, will not be conserved over here. All right, you don't see as much, especially in interferometers. The amount of light you get back out of the device is much smaller than the amount of light you put into the device. Um, and so anyway, but. So, so that's all. We're just talking about a change in direction. There's no need to make any waves. All right. Um, like I said, you didn't say anything. You can observe that with light using a cheap laser pointer. So again, I, this is just a ludicrous conversation. I explained to you. I, I, I have already shown the videotape, okay, of Professor Lewin taking a simple, you know, I, so frankly, I've done so many single slit, single and double slit experiments. But I mean, you know, he, he takes a, a variable, you know, a little screw is on here. He can make the slit smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, and there's a pa there's always a pattern. There's never not a pattern. I mean, unless the slit's way way open, okay, then you got no pattern. But as soon as you get to a millimeter or so, um, pattern, pattern, pattern. And all you do is, is, is 
take the pattern that's a lot of little bars when it's wide open and all you're doing is, is essentially magnifying it so you're just making it all spread out <clears throat> so then the center thing gets really big and then the little thing over here and a little thing over here um, but that's all you're doing you're just spreading the light so the smaller the slit the more it spreads and the, the, my rational argument would be well that's perfectly consistent with a model that recognizes that the surfaces are what's causing the bending and the s narrower and narrower the slit the more likely it is the photon's going to be near a surface so the more likely it is it's going to get bent Jeez. I mean, but this patronizing nonsense. I mean, who the fuck do you think you are? So if I did that on a Professor Lewin video, if I sat there and just patronized him, you know, and told him, well, there's this thing called the electric field, Mr. Lewin, and this thing, you know, who the fuck do you think you are? Anyway, I've got over a thousand videos on this channel. All right, so should I do that on other physicist videos, right? I'll go out to, to the these teachers and the rest of them. And I'll type tripe like that on their videos. And you think they should tolerate it? They should They should do something other than just block me for being a patronizing tool? Fuck you. All right. <clears throat> you can use the wave function to derive that intensity distribution. So again, you're just talking shit. All right. I've pointed out how your math has an obligation. You're using the same mathematical formula to describe two entirely different patterns. So the photons do this, and the electrons do this. Well, I can't even do a proper job of it, but uh, so the, the point is that the two patterns you're fighting with uh, is this pattern. <coughs> You know, gradual on and off, gradual on and off, gradual on and off, with on, on, on. The same math can't do that. So one of those is out, outside the line of your theory. One of them is not being predicted by your math. Your math isn't predicting the photon. The visible photon pattern is not predicted by your math. Your math will not get the intensity here and the intensity here correct you'll get it incorrect because these two patterns are not the same. <clears throat> uh, cause so uh, that's just horseshit to rely on your silly uh, math. Um, okay. Where their distribution on the screen is similar to the intensity distribution of light, single and double slit. So again, it's, it's not... Um, but whatever. The idea behind QM is to assign such a wave function to single electrons to describe the pattern. So again, it doesn't matter. There's, the, the point is, is that you can't have it both ways. You can't say that one electron goes into the single slit, turns into two wave functions that interfere, and then say when I have a double slit, okay, all of a sudden there's not two electrons coming out of this slit and two electrons coming out of this slit. There's not four electrons. There's no consistency in your theory. How are you addressing that lack of consistency? Uh, that's it. Um, where's the magic in that? Well, I just pointed out the magic in it. Okay, the complete contradiction in logic. Single slits create two wave functions. Double slits create two wave functions doesn't make any sense all right mindless marvel says uh, can you check your discord messages so you got unblocked for this you know he, he obligated me to unblock him because he was going to say something interesting and this is the best he can do fucking cunt all right Jesus, you people are just so fucking desperately stupid. So some other troll linked to this pointless bit of drivel. Okay, so this is some... See, these are their papers. It's a peer review paper. Well, it's in whatever, the uh, letters to some um, uh, paper. Um, so, so this is just really a, a rephrase of the Wikipedia page on the... Um, um, proofs of general relativity. 
And again, the experiments don't prove anything. So it brings up Eddington and attempts to defend that and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? And so we already know the facts about those experiments. And, um, and then we also know that, like, you know, as I explained, you can do, you can do a, an experiment, you know, where... <clears throat> so, so you use um, radio telescopes, right, which have low resolution, not high resolution. Let's understand that as the first case. So you have a radio source, that is, something's making noise out here. And then you have the sun here, and then you have us observing here. And um, so what they'll say is, is, okay, we did this interferometry thing, we do all this stuff to detect this radio source. And we can see the radio source before the object is visible, right? But the real problem with that is, is again, it's this whole argument where the NASA scientist points out there's no... There's no experiment where we see bending outside the corona of the sun. So the problem is, is the sun creates a corona that's actually a full radius and more of its diameter. So you have to go a full radius out here, and it's still really a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of little particles, a lot of atmosphere. The sun has a huge atmosphere. I mean, it's gigantic, okay, and that's the corona. You could argue that the, the Earth has a corona, a little thin atmosphere, a few miles, and that's it. Okay, <laughs> the sun's corona is huge. The sun's atmosphere is huge. So all they're really doing is saying, well, look, the light goes through the corona, all right? NASA has plenty of bending in the corona. You know, it's easy to bend light in the corona. Um, <clears throat> and so what happens is it's, it scatters, okay, inside the, the particles of the sun's atmosphere, and it goes everywhere, okay? Some of the light goes here, some of the light goes here, some of the light goes here, some of the light goes here. So this, so no matter where you go, you'll get some energy from the scatter. So that's the clear argument. There's no gravity bending it. Particles are bending it, all right? The, the, it's, it's just refraction. It's just, you know, the simple mechanics of any other circumstance where scatter will create all of these directions. So obviously one segment of the signal will make it to you, okay, before the object is visible, um, the whole time, because one of these lines, okay, will exist for every location. So, yes, I mean, obviously, it'll get much stronger here. You'll get a lot more energy coming this way than this way. So, it's obviously a lot less scatter this way than there would be this way. But clearly, you can receive the signal before you would think you could because some of it will take the shorter path. They have no way of saying on Earth here, saying, well, we figured out what was scatter, <laughs> okay, and ignored that part. They have no way to do that. Absolutely zero way, zero. Zero way to, in any way, filter the signal and say, no, that was a scatter signal. They have no way of doing it. So again, it's not evidence of light uh, being bent or energy being bent by gravity. All right, so then this image, which I should try to give you a blow up of it, but hell with it. So it's some uh, <coughs> quasar behind a galaxy. So, so the swirly parts the galaxy, right? And with, the, with some kind of bright center, I, I imagine that's what they're saying. And those little pink or little white dots they're claiming are the lens thing. That's the thing way far away that they're seeing in the galaxy. Now, what's so stupid about these people is, see, it's one thing to say, okay, a real object, you could, you could take something that was a circle, okay, and you could bend it <coughs> into a funny shape, okay? So, I mean, I could, I could take it off its axis, and it would end up looking, you know, oblong, okay, because I've turned it this way. So it was a perfect circle, Right, and all I did was I took the perfect circle and I turned it. So you're looking at the wrong angle. So you can sort of see that that's not, we're not head on there. But you can't turn the lensed image. <laughs> the lensed image can't be turned. So if you saw something with a perfect circle, you can't turn it. You know, it was lensed, perfectly lensed. You can't turn the lens and still see it. It's not a real object in the lens. The lens is just bending light. So it's not a real object that you can say, oh, yeah, it's sending me light, you know. 
It's not a real object. So the only way you can see any Einstein functions, that is anything that um, has um, from gravitational symmetry, um, you can see one object as a ring, right? So the theory would be the Einstein ring would be the, the thing is producing the energy. It goes through the lens and the lens creates, <coughs> well, I should draw it this way, I guess. It creates this ring. So the distant object is way behind something else. Okay, and the gravity takes that light and it's all the same distance, all the same amount of gravity, and it'll produce this little sliver of a ring. Now, Einstein said you'd never see one of these because it's only going to be three photons wide, so it's impossible that you ever see it. Um, but they ignore all those facts. But the point is, the only way you could possibly see it is you'd have to see the, the, the two, the galaxy would have to be perfectly symmetrical in front of you, and then the object has to be right in the center for you to have an object show up over here and an object show up over here. And again, the object showing up is impossible anyway, but let's just say we allowed you to have these, you know, hundreds of light years across objects actually get bent, the light get bent by gravity, the right amount to all come to a focus here, right? So each piece of this has to bend just the right amount to come to a focus for us to see it. And that's impossible because the lens is the wrong shape, okay? There's more gravity here, which means there's more bending, which means the light goes over there. So that's not going to help you. And the light over here that you need to bend more, it doesn't bend enough, so that doesn't create a focus. So that can't happen anyway. But let's just say it could happen. Even if we, even if we create fake physics to make this possible, what will never happen is you can't turn the lens, you know, turn the galaxy, and still see the objects. They're not real objects, you lunatics. So you see that huge disproportion from one on one on one side and the other side. How it's how it's way off the circle. I mean, way off the circle. I mean, one's one of them's here and one of them's over here, right? I mean, here's the center. I mean, it's not even close to the same, right? So it's obviously you know a warp of perspective, but it's not a real object. So the only way you could possibly see it, it has to be head on to get the right angles. And there's no way, there's no, there's no rational way you could say there's 500 times more gravity on this side of the galaxy than there is on that side. It could never have that kind of asymmetry. It could never exist with that kind of asymmetry. It wouldn't be a spiral galaxy if it had that kind of asymmetry. So you can't see three little objects over here and one over here and have uh, this be, you know, 10 or, or let's say just twice as much, twice as much distance, 2x distance here as there is here. It's not freaking possible. There's no mathematics in the universe that makes that make sense. So here they just show this crappy propaganda, these composite images. They're not even real images, by the way. I mean, they're images taken from a bunch of different data and crammed into one picture. Um, <laughs> so, but it can't happen. It's it's a theoretical pile of shit. You cannot have one of the things. Again, it's twice as close. Twice. You can't have a lopsided Einstein ring. You can't have lopsided lensing. <sighs> so, so I mean, this is all they got is this this absolute crap. There's no theory defending this image as lensing. It just can't be defended as a lensed image. Yeah, but you people are just hopelessly, uh, you know, you're just hopeless dupes. Stupid, fucking, belligerently stupid fuckers. You just want to be stupid. You want to believe in your little fairies, right? This is all this comes down to is you want a fairy uh, explanation of reality. You want some sort of Goldilocks bullshit, happily ever after bullshit. Oh, I'm going to kiss a frog someday and marry the prince and... <laughs> I mean, you're fucking little girls. You're not even philosophers. You're just sissy little girls. Ugh. Anyway. Fuck you. People are so fucking stupid to buy this bullshit. <sighs>